much, Avi, for inviting me and to all of you for being here today. Um, all over the world, different time zones, you seem to have found a perfect time that, you know, allows people to, to get here at different points in their day. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about something that is coming out of a developing research project. I'm still working on different parts of it. Um, and this is the part that I, you know, maybe figured out a little bit more than others, but I welcome any feedback that you may have and, and really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. If you have any issues seeing that, just let me know. Okay. That look good to everybody? Yes, all good. Great. Um, so the title of my talk is The Moral Meanings of Fiscal Earmarking, War Taxes, Patriotism, and Resistance. And so I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about tax paying in America, because that's the backdrop for my broader project. And it really helps to, I think, uh, start by recognizing that for most people, most of the time, tax paying is a mundane fact of life. And I, you know, I'm curious to hear if this is similar in, in the places where each of you are sitting. But, you know, in America, it's, uh, it's not especially salient. Uh, it's often referred to as inevitable that it, there's, you know, you can only be sure of death and taxes. And so we just sort of submit to this. Um, and many people treat it as kind of a bill that just must be paid, like a credit card bill or any other bill, electricity bill that comes throughout the year. Uh, on tax day uh, and around tax day, which is usually on April 15th, there's a great deal of grumbling. You're, you're likely to see political cartoons like these, you know, dear IRS, please remove me from your mailing list. Um, at my age, every day is pretty taxing, but it's like a light grumbling that actually offers a source of collective commiseration, like talking about traffic or the weather. Um, and this mundane aspect of tax paying, the fact that it was viewed as kind of a routine fact of life, was actually intentional. Um, when, when the sort of income tax in the United States was introduced to the broader public, it had gone from being what was called a class tax that only applied to the wealthiest, you know, small portion of individuals. During World War II, it was expanded so that almost all Americans were asked to pay an income tax. And the Treasury Department engaged in a large propaganda messaging campaign to convince Americans that this was a routine part of their lives, that it wouldn't be too difficult, and that it would be, you know, kind of worth it for them to contribute in this way. Um, in this radio spot, that was produced by the Writers' War Board. Uh, the authors wrote, paying taxes can be compared to daily shaving. It's never any fun, but you get used to it. And very few men choose the only alternative, which is raising a beard. So encouraging Americans to think of tax paying as mundane, as routine. But, and this is the part that interests me the most, at certain points in time in American history, um, and for some people more than others, tax paying is transformed. It's transformed from something mundane into something bigger and more significant. And tax dollars themselves take on a special meaning. And so in the terms that make the most sense to me as a sociologist of religion, I view this as a, pra as a, a sort of a moment of sacralization where tax paying is sacralized. And so the question that, I, that I'm asking is why and how does this process of sacralization occur? So to get some answers to that question, I went looking at a couple of literatures that offer insights into how money is made sacred in other domains, right? Not tax dollars, but just other kinds of dollars. And Viviana Zelitzer and uh, a growing group of economic sociologists have been working on this question related to household monies um, and other kinds of financial exchanges, looking at how money takes on special social and moral meanings under different circumstances. So that's become a really useful literature for me. And I'll come back in a moment to how, uh, how I'm going to be using that literature. 
There's also a literature on other kinds of self-sacrificing behaviors, including religious giving. So when people give money to religious charities, to their church, right? There's, there's an interesting literature asking sort of what leads people to engage in that altruistic kind of behavior. And that, it turns out, actually offers a lot of insights into how people think of tax paying, which in some ways might be surprising because one of those forms of giving is voluntary and one is compulsory, meaning it's required by law. But tax paying, at least in the United States, is often likened to religious and charitable giving. People will refer to a tax as, you know, akin to a tithe, right? Something that you owe your community. Many proponents of the flat tax in the United States will say we should only be taxed 10% like a tithe. Why should we owe Caesar more than we owe God? Um, and so these, these parallels are often uh, remarked on by members of the public. And so it, it makes sense that similar logics might guide people's thinking about both of these kinds of monetary exchanges. So what is it that this literature tells us that we can use to better understand tax paying? One, we know that religious organizations vary in the extent to which they sacralize giving and money in general, much like we see that variation in regards to tax paying. There are some religious organizations, church cultures that talk about giving uh, through a similar kind of mundane pay the bills framework where they say, you know, we have to pay rent on the church. We have to pay pastor salaries. Uh, so if everybody could chip in, that helps us to pay the bills, like not, not in any way sacred. But on the other hand, there are churches in the U.S. that encourage their, their members to view giving as a sacred act, as a way of living the vision of the church, and to see money itself as belonging to God, as sacred. And so in these cultures, it, when we look at the difference between sort of organizations that sort of mark money and giving as sacred, we actually do see that that can, under certain circumstances, boost people's generosity boost their willingness to give money to those organizations. What some colleagues of mine have identified though, which I find incredibly useful, is that there's also different ways of sacralizing giving at different churches. And in particular, there's two different sacralizing frames that organizations use to encourage people to view giving through a sacred lens. On one hand, there's what they call a process frame, which sacralizes the very act of giving. So by giving, you are living the vision, right? By giving, you are kind of marking yourself as part of the sacred community. There's also, though, a product frame, and that product frame is sacralizing the outcome of giving, that it's the sacred, the thing that is sacred is what we're able to do with that money. We're able to build a beloved community together. We're able to do works of charity in our community together. And it's that outcome that's actually sacred. And what they find is that these frames can operate in combination with each other or individually, and that we can sort of mark variation across different organizations by looking at these two different kinds of frames. And so this is a really useful uh, thing for me to think with, and, and I'll show you in a moment how that, that comes into play. But there's, in order to kind of make sense of this, there's also another literature that I look to, and that's the sociology of the sacred. In particular, um, you know, this literature shows us that sacred and profane distinctions are central to our collective meaning making. So this act of, of sacralization is a really common part of our lives as a community. And and it's not just limited to religious settings per se. We know that distinctions between sacred and profane objects and symbols 
uh, shapes our politics and shapes a variety of other domains um, and work being done within cultural sociology by people like Jeff Alexander shows how this works in a variety of domains. Uh, Gordon Lynch argues, though, that if we just look at a distinction between sacred and profane, we're missing some of the complexity here. And in particular, he argues that Durkheim overloads too many concepts into the category of the profane so that it's everything other than the sacred. So it's either sacred or it's profane. But that it's more useful if we distinguish between different things that are not sacred. So we can have these mundane rhythms and conventions of everyday life, which are very different from things that we would mark as profane, right? Or specific forms of evil that are threatening the sacred, right? And then we can also look at, at processes of desecration, which are ritual attempts to sort of challenge the sacred order. And so drawing on, you know, all of this, I, I want to look at how, if we try to import this into the context of tax paying, we can ask whether the act of sacralizing either the act of tax paying through that process frame or the use of tax dollars with that product frame increases consent to taxation, right? In the way that we see in the religious giving literature. But in the case of tax paying, it's really clear once you start looking at how people talk about this, that it's not just a question of being mundane or sacred, that there's another alternative as well that we have to take into account. And that's the possibility that once tax paying is lifted out of the realm of the mundane, of the everyday, it can also be transformed into something profane. And that similarly to how we sort of use these process and product frames to encourage people to see tax paying as sacred, these exact same frames can be used to encourage people to view tax paying as profane, to see the act of tax paying as profane and to see the use of tax dollars as profane. And that these frames actually can be used to encourage resistance. And so in my talk today, I'm gonna to focus in particular at two parts of this. My broader project actually uh, explores all of the, the sort of the four different pieces of this. But today I'm just gonna be focusing on how uh, in two different kinds of contexts, we see the use of a sacralizing frame that emphasizes how the use of tax dollars are sacred and how this is used to encourage consent and how the use of tax dollars is framed as profane and how this is used to encourage resistance. And in order to understand this better, I draw on that earlier literature I mentioned, uh, Viviana Zelitzer's work on how people engage in something called earmarking in order to assign meaning to particular uses of monies. And so what do I mean by earmarking? Earmarking is essentially an effort to create distinctions among uses and meanings of different monies. This has been applied in you know, a variety of other studies to household monies that people maybe will put money in different kinds of cans or accounts or mental categories if it's going to be spent on fun things versus bills, if it's going to be sent back home as remittances or if it's going to be spent on kids' college savings, and that those monies are kept separate and have different meanings for people. We also see that you know, this operates in the context of gift giving in different kinds of market-based transactions. And what I argue is that we can also use this framework to understand public monies like taxes. And so how does this work in the context of taxes? When we think of what I'm calling fiscal earmarking, right, we can distinguish between two forms that this takes. One is the more commonly understood kind, which I call structural earmarking. This actually happens through formal legal processes where some tax revenues are formally set aside for only certain purposes. So in the United States context, we know that um, 
gasoline tax, the tax that we pay at the gas pump, can only be used to repair highways and other infrastructure. It's placed into what's called a trust fund, and it can only be used for those purposes. The same is true for how uh, we've set up Social Security. There's a special tax that's taken out of our paycheck, and that money goes into a Social Security trust fund, and that money can only be used for Social Security. This is what I'm calling sort of structural earmarking, where we know where our money is going. We know where at least some of our tax dollars are going. And we can then decide if we think that's good or bad. But there's much more widespread use of what I'm calling symbolic earmarking, where we're just focusing disproportionately on certain uses of general tax revenues. And so a lot of the taxes that Americans pay, particularly through the income tax, essentially goes into a big pot. And then from that big pot, millions of things get paid for that are you know, decided through our federal budget. But people tend to focus on one or two specific things, right? They tend to focus on, for example, as I'll show, the, the, the part of that money that is going to defense or the very, very small part of that money that is going to abortion, which is another case that I'm looking at in the broader project, or the very small amount of that money that might be going to you know, any number of specific welfare programs, right? Those aren't structurally earmarked, right? We're not able to say some dollars go into an account that only pays for defense, but we can kind of imagine that some of our dollars are going toward these ends and then make different kinds of moral judgments about whether we think that's a good or a bad thing. And it turns out that this is a very common part of our political rhetoric about tax paying in the United States. Today, I'm gonna to be talking in particular about this link that I show on screen, this link from income taxes to the defense budget and how at two different sort of contexts, people have framed that as either sacred or profane. And I can talk a little bit more about this if people have questions, but war taxes have historically uh, been both structural and symbolic. There have been earmarked war taxes that are raised specifically for war. Um, but today, war finance, is coming out of the general budget and often being paid for through debt. And so this has changed over time and is a blend of both kinds of structural and symbolic earmarking. So the research I'm gonna be talking to you about today um, is based on a study that I've conducted on the practice of war tax resistance in the United States. This is a practice that's been employed since the colonial era um, but it was most prominent during the Vietnam uh, War. Uh, people who engage in this practice refuse to pay all or part of the federal income taxes that enable war making. For some people, that means that they refuse to pay any income taxes. For some people, this means they refuse to pay the proportion of their income taxes that they believe is going to pay for defense. For some people, they refuse to pay some token amount as a symbol of their resistance. Um, this practice was pioneered by the historic peace churches, in particular, uh, the, the Quakers, the Society of Friends, has been a leading force in encouraging this practice at different points in time. Uh, today, though, uh, people who engage in war tax resistance are both religious and secular um, and come from a range of different religious traditions. Uh, the main organization that coordinates the work of war tax resistors and provides education and information for them uh, called the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee or NUTRIC uh, estimates that there's about 10 to eight to 10,000 resistors in the US today. I've also heard estimates up to about 12,000. It's very hard to measure this. There's no official uh, statistics on this. So how did I study these groups. Well, first, actually, uh, let me clarify some, some sort of frequently asked questions about war tax resistors. First, they distinguish themselves and are distinguished by observers from another group of tax protesters, people who don't pay taxes, who are on the 
on the right wing of American politics and often engage in this practice because they are anti-government. This group is not that group, and I can talk more about that group as well. Uh, most of the people who engage in this practice, although not all, will identify themselves as not libertarians. Again, they're not engaging this practice because they don't like the government or they don't believe in taxation. They're engaging in this as an act of conscientious objection or civil disobedience. Um, similarly, because of that, they don't sort of view themselves as tax evaders or people engaging in tax avoidance which they view as, as sort of rooted in self-interest and keeping money for yourself. Um, and I can talk more about that. Most war tax resistors, although not all, will resist publicly, meaning they will announce themselves to the IRS and to their communities, um, because again, they view this as a form of you know, public political resistance. Uh, some frame it as civil disobedience, some as conscientious objection. I studied this group in a variety of different ways. Um, I've conducted interviews with a number of war tax resistors. Um, I also have over the years collected a database of their writings and uh, both through sort of publicly available materials, books, and also uh, from two different archives. Um, from that material, I've done an analysis of letters that they have written to the IRS. I have over 500 of those letters. Um, a number of their memoirs and oral histories, transcripts of videos, autobiographical essays, and other firsthand accounts of resistance. Um, through this, I also did an analysis of, of a secondary historical literature on the history of war finance, war taxes, um, and in particular, government efforts to encourage uh, consent to this new system of taxation that was put into place during World War II. So the first part of my analysis is based on that literature. And then the second part is based on my primary sort of materials on the war tax resistors. Just and so, so you know, around 10 minutes. OK, be, great. Yeah. Um, so what I found was that uh, the kinds of sacralizing frames symbolically earmarking the use of tax dollars for war uh, was used to encourage consent, while symbolically earmarking the use of tax dollars for war and framing that as profane was, in, was used to encourage resistance. So I'm just going to show two quick videos to show how this works in the context of uh, sort of propaganda efforts to encourage consent to the war, to new taxes that pay for war. And the way that this is framed is that your dollars that you are paying through your taxes will directly contribute to the war effort and that this war effort is sacred. Therefore, your, you know, sort of tax paying itself is sacred. Um, the sort of crown jewel of this, uh, is this video by that Disney release that was shown in movie theaters all over the country called The New Spirit. And I'll show you just a short clip of that. There is a new spirit in America. The spirit of a free people united again in a common cause to stamp tyranny from the earth. Our very shores have been attacked. Your whole country is mobilizing for total war. Your country needs you. Are you a patriotic American? Yes, sir. Eager to do your part? Yes, sir. Then there's something important you can do. You won't get a medal for doing it. It may mean a sacrifice on your part. But it will be a vital help to your country in this hour of need. Shall I tell you what it is? Shall I? Tell me what it is. Your income tax. Income tax? Yes, your income tax. Income tax. It may not seem important to you, but it is important. What? Yes, and it's your privilege, not just your duty, but your privilege to help your government by paying your tax and paying it promptly. Oh. What's the big hurry? What's the big hurry? Your country is at war. Your country needs taxes for guns, taxes for ships, taxes for democracy. 
taxes to beat the axis. Oh, boy! Taxes to beat the axis! That's the spirit. Yes, sir! Now, how about your income tax? Oh, boy! Yes, sir! Okay, and then a short clip from a song I, I heard in Berlin. Tax today. I'm only one of millions more whose income never was taxed before. A tax I'm very glad to pay. I'm squared up with the USA. You see those bombers in the sky. Rockefeller helped to build them, so did I. I paid my income tax today. So in both cases, we can see that people are encouraged to view tax paying as sort of this important patriotic act, and also to imagine that their tax dollars that they are paying, right, whether they're paying $1 or the amount that Rockefeller is paying, is going to be directly supporting the war effort. Taxes for planes, taxes for ships, taxes to beat the axis. Um, and so there's this very direct kind of understanding of where their tax dollars are going. Now, we can see there. here, in the case of war tax resistors, that they actually use the exact same framing to talk about where your money is going and how our money is directly funding the war effort. But in their framing, that's not sacred, it's profane. And that's because either the war uh, during a particular time period is viewed as a bad war, as an unjust or an immoral war, or simply because war itself is framed as immoral, unjust, a sin. And so we can see in these uh, in these signs, right? War not with my money, I refuse to pay. I would no more pay the IRS than kill for the Pentagon, equating paying tax dollars for war with killing. This is central to the kinds of iconography that this movement uses. If you don't believe in war, then why pay for it? Showing you know bags of money going into a uh, to, into a missile. If you work for peace, stop paying for war. I can talk more about this. This is a, a pie chart that's been produced every year for several decades by the War Resisters League in New York City. And it shows uh, through their own calculations that about half of your income tax is going to support the military. And so many people will, will refuse to pay that proportion of their income tax, understanding that that is directly going to support the military. And we can see in this letter that somebody wrote to the IRS, uh, in 2017, we support our country in all of its peaceful endeavors, but for reasons of conscious and religious faith, we do not support our country in its preparation for war and in war making. And then we're deeply troubled by the fact that about half of the federal income tax that we owe is budgeted for military expenditures to buy the tools and the manpower to kill our fellow men and women. And so a very similar kind of framing to the previous examples, but again, framing this in profane terms and using this as a justification for resisting paying their taxes. And so just to kind of summarize, right, we see that by sacralizing the use of tax dollars for war, individuals are made to feel pride in or take credit for their personal contributions to a sacred war effort, and this encourages consent. But on the flip side of this, by profaning the use of those tax dollars for war, individuals feel personally complicit in the profane atrocities of war. And so we see these driving two opposing kinds of behaviors. But at the same time, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that this process of earmarking also personalizes and individualizes that transaction so that it's my tax dollars purchasing something specific. And that in doing this, right, there's kind of a shared recognition across both of these cases of the sacredness of that individual um, as a moral agent. And that resonates with kind of the broader individualism at the heart of American culture. Um, and we see that across sort of a variety of cases on the left, right, and in between. So I'm going to stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. <laughs>